This Taylor rule calculation is telling us you're too low by about 300 basis points. The Fed is going to have a very hard time slowing down the machine. Because the Russians, they tried to find a way around it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lackley here in Paris. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Fed officials out in force again. Bullard warns the Fed may be behind the curve, calling for rates at 3% or more this year. The EU bans Russian coal imports, targeting Putin's energy revenue for the first time. The U.S. Congress turns the nation into a trade pariah. Plus, the home stretch as France's presidential election looms. Polls show Emmanuel Macron's lead over Marine Le Pen narrowing further. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, from France. We'll try and game theory exactly what happens on Friday and then what happens in the second round. But first, let's get trade straight to the markets. Uh, Danny Berger is in London. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. It is a rally when it comes to European equity markets this morning. About an hour into the cash equity trade, gains mostly of 1% across the board. The best performing sector, you have energy, you have materials, more growth-sensitive type indices doing well. And at the same time, you're looking also not as strong, but gains in S&P 500 futures. Of course, they rose yesterday while Europe fell, so a little bit of evening out there. Meanwhile, the euro continues to fall uh, down one-tenth of 1% versus the dollar, not only is this the euro's longest losing streak since 2016 we are looking at a two-year high on the dollar it's that hawkishness from the fed the divergence or at least perceived divergence between the fed and the ecb meanwhile that bond selling taking a break uh barely unchanged on the 10-year yield so let me dive into the map and francine this one's really for you because france outperforming pretty significantly it had been underperforming this week, still on track for a weekly loss, despite the fact the wider index is set for a weekly gain. A lot of that is the market starting to price in some of the tail risks of what a Le Pen victory would mean for a lot of these French companies. Francine, I also want to bring us some breaking lines. We just got the United Nations World Food Index. Not only did it rise the most ever, 13 percent, but the current price it's on is also a record. This is the seventh straight quarterly gain. That in itself is the longest streak of gains since 2008. So we already had problems before the war broke out when it came to high energy prices, demand destruction. But of course, Francine, Ukraine's ports are closed and that region accounts for about a quarter of exports when it comes to food prices, Francine. Yeah, of course, a huge deal for the people, of course, in the world, I and mean, for everyone, but especially the ones that have yeah. the least. So we hope that it's fiscal spending and maybe a bit of uh, the richer nations also helping the ones that can't afford it. Now, after Wednesday's FOMC minutes, top hawk and voter James Bullard called for raising rates by as much as 300 basis points this year and suggested he backs a half a point hike in May. Now, non-voters Charles Evans and Raphael Bostic also weighed in. This Taylor rule calculation is telling us that where we should be in a minimal, under minimal assumptions, very generous assumptions, it's saying it should be at three and a half percent. Where we actually uh, only one third of one percent or 37 and a half basis points. So you're too low by about 300 basis points. I think it's fully appropriate that we move our policy uh, uh, closer to a neutral position. Uh, but I think we need to do it in a measured way. Adjusting monetary policy from our very accommodative stance after uh, COVID towards a neutral setting by the end of the year, probably certainly early next year, depending on what the pace will be. Well, we're joined by Michaela Marcus and Chief Economist at Societe Générale. Michaela, thank you so much for joining us. We have many questions, but we have to start with the Fed, of course, on inflation. First of all, what does it mean for the rest of the world? It does feel like the Fed is now central banker to the world. If they do 50 basis point hikes, do they risk a recession that could ripple globally? I don't think a 50 basis point hike per se would risk recession. But if we start seeing a succession of rate hikes, much more aggressive, much more rapidly, then I think we do risk to see a, a much more substantial slowdown in the U.S. Keep in mind that we, the Fed is tightening into fiscal tightening as well, and I think this is very important. It's also tightening into a situation where even in the U.S., while demand side shocks have been important in driving past deflation, we also see the supply side driving inflationary shocks and that means that we already see consumer confidence at very low levels in the US so I do have concerns that too aggressive Fed tightening would push us into 
a sharp slowdown, if not a recession. So what's too aggressive? I mean, philosophically, is the Fed really now choosing between, you know, whether to lower inflation or to, to save economic growth? Well, I think there, there's clearly a trade-off here between the two, and it's a very good question. What is too fast? What is too slow? But I think um, a, a measured approach from the Fed is, is, is probably the best way to go here, just taking it nice and steady and, and, and minding what happens in the underlying economy. Keep in mind, we still do have a lot of frictions from, from the pandemic hanging around in the economic system. We see it on the labor markets that are not fully normalized yet. We see it in consumer spending patterns. We also see it in global supply chains. So I think it's very important that the Fed keeps a, a steady pace here rather than going too quickly, uh, just to be able to see as those underlying effects start to fade out how things work in the economy. So, so what are those underlying effects? I guess, you know, people not being in the labor market so much is simply because they're at home, because they have to care for the elderly or things like that? Well, what we've started, what we saw with the previous employment report is we already start to see some normalization coming through, people being able to come back to the labor market. We do see the participation rate improving. But I think where we also see some of the frictions is just in the rehiring process, just in the reopening after the pandemic. Um, so I think it's those effects that we need to see normalize as we move forward. I just don't see how inflation pans out from here. And I know that, you know, we could see some kind of stabilization. But if you ask for a wage increase, then they're not going to take it away. If I'm paying £2.50 for my cappuccino, oh, and I know it's very basic, but, you know, that's not going to be lowered at the end of the day. How do you see inflation progressing? Well, I, I think what's quite interesting is we're, we're, we're clearly seeing a, a run-up in headline inflation right now, which is driven by energy prices. Our forecast is for oil prices to end the year at $100 per barrel and then steadily ease lower in the course of 2023. And that means that just from a base effect, we will see headline inflation coming down. But keep in mind, there will be lagged effects. Uh, rental prices, uh, some adjustment to wages uh, here in Europe as well, also indexation of pensions, all of these things. So I think we'll see some lagged effects on the core inflation coming through. But coming into next year, I do expect some of these very high headline numbers to ease lower. Having said that, consumer purchasing power will still remain under pressure. And that's where I think the interesting thing to watch here is what companies are telling us they see on pricing power. Because remember, so far, we, we companies were able to enjoy pricing power because we still had that, that lagged effect from pent-up savings, from the pent-up fiscal demand coming from the pandemic effects. Um, we have at UN food prices, of course, at a record high. And I mean, this has huge implications politically also for stability. I mean, you could see a famine in certain parts of, of you know, West and Northern Africa. How should we look at this in terms of you know, the, the households that are just about making it now and what kind of fiscal support they would need? So I think we have to make a very big difference between countries that have fiscal room to support lower yes. income households. And we see that happening already here in Europe. Um, but then, of course, when we look at economies that do not have fiscal room, and here we're talking about many of the low-income, developing, emerging economies, this situation around the food prices is clearly a major concern. And there's also a concern, as, as you're well aware, on the food supply issue, with many of these countries being dependent on imports from the Ukraine and Russia for key cereals. All right, Mikhail, thank you so much. You see how Mikhail is so placid? I mean, she's not even cold. I'm like shivering here in the outside as it's raining. But I'm when you're a chief economist inside. at Cisajal, <laughs> you just keep your cool. We'll be back with Mikhaila Markison shortly. Let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Shanghai has reported more than 20,000 new COVID cases for the past 24 hours, marking its highest tally since the start of the pandemic. The city is racing to create isolation facilities as it sticks to a policy of quarantining all those positive for the virus, as well as everyone they have interacted with. Complaints are growing from residents about the strict nature of China's COVID zero strategy. And Kajani Brown Jackson has been confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, making history as the first black woman ever to join its ranks. Jackson is a Harvard Law School graduate and former public defender. She will join the top U.S. court when Justice Stephen Breyer retires, and that's happening this summer. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. 
this is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, the U.S. and the EU step up sanctions on Russia over its war in Ukraine. We'll get the very latest on that. We'll speak to a number of reporters on the ground as well. The latest on geopolitics next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. Now, we're covering the election. We're also keeping a very close eye on the economy. So Emmanuel Macron has spent the last week trying to connect with voters ahead of this Sunday's first round presidential election. But will it be enough to actually maintain what has become a narrowing lead over his competitor, Marine Le Pen? Let's get more on the markets. Let's get more on what this means for the economy with Michaela Marcuson, chief economist at Societe Generale. Michaela, thank you so much for uh, braving the cold and the wind with me. When you look at the, the narrowing polls, it was a surprise to many because many said, like, look, Emmanuel Macron has this, don't worry about it, it's going to be a snooze fest. Now, maybe it's improbable, but it's not impossible that Marine Le Pen becomes president. What does that mean for the French economy? So I think a very important point to, to make, as you say, for now, it's a it's a tail risk scenario, but it is, it is a, a risk scenario that we have to take seriously and consider. And in that case, the attention will move immediately in such a scenario to the legislative elections. Keep in mind, June 12 and 19, we have legislative elections here in France. And the big question would be if Madame Le Pen would then also have a majority in the National Assembly. Now, this is where things get very complicated and very choppy, because if she doesn't have a majority in the National Assembly, then it depends a lot on how she appoints her interim government, whether she leaves it in place, whether she starts trying to call referenda on various issues. And one of the issues could be to try and move the electoral system to a proportional vote and then call for new elections again. So you can see it becomes a very yeah. choppy political environment. And I think we would have a, a prolonged period just of pure political uncertainty in such a scenario. Looking further down the road, when we look at some of the initiatives that Madame Le Pen has in her program, while she has stepped back from calling for a French exit from the euro and the yes. EU, there are still a number of issues relating, for example, to rights of, uh, of foreigners yep. in France that could still set her up and for borders. some tensions with Brussels right. in that respect. So, it, so it's Michaela, going to be a complicated relationship. So for an international investor, and I know our sophisticated audience probably knows this, but how would you describe Marine Le Pen? She's anti-globalization, right? She's populist. What kind of, and I know there's a million nuances about parliamentary or not, but actually what does she, does she want to spend her way out of the crisis? So I think it's, it's always very difficult to put labels and, and, you know, put people into simple boxes like this because I do think it's more complicated than that. But if we look at the economic program, there's a very big chunk on immigration. There's a very big chunk on pension rights, keeping the pension age unchanged and allowing people to retire at 60 when they started working below 20. We also see that there are a number of measures aimed at indexing cost of living. So we see all those traditional measures. And when we add up those budgetary spends, there is a concern on the ability to keep public debt under control with such an, econ with such an economic platform. There, there's a very strong chance still that, of course, Emmanuel Macron has a second term. Yes. How will that change his current policies? Are we going to see more reforms or are we going to see a boost for business? So I think, again, that question about what type of majority he will enjoy in the National Assembly is very important because that will tell us something about the strength of the mandate that he enjoys. And if he does have a majority, we should expect uh, 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 Emmanuel Macron to push down the road of pension reforms and continue with the structural reforms that we've seen that he already pushed in the, in the first mandate. Okay, Miguel, thanks so much. Don't go anywhere because I want to talk to you about the oil embargo and the impact on the European economy. But sanctions are being ramped up on Russia for the war in Ukraine. The European Union agreed to ban coal imports as part of its fifth round of sanctions, the first measure targeting Russia's crucial energy revenue. Now, the U.S. Congress has also voted overwhelmingly to take further action, stripping Russia of its normal trade status and banning imports of the nation's gas, oil and coal. So for more 
on all of this. We're now joined by Bloomberg senior reporter for international affairs, Mark Champion. Mark, always a pleasure to have you on TV. Will the new sanctions from the U.S. and the EU actually change anything for Putin in terms of his warmongering efforts in Ukraine? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that they will have uh, some impact on the economy. I mean, the Russian economy is being hit by this. It is surviving, but it is being hit. Um, but there's no discernible impact on, in terms of his uh, calculus for the war as yet. Uh, and it's unlikely that these measures will change that. Um, you know, at the moment, what he's doing, he's had a sort of rather unsuccessful war until now. Uh, and But he's now, his, the military is regrouping. They're going to uh, attack in the east, concentrate their forces. Um, so and that's likely to happen, and it will be a big challenge for Ukraine. Um, Mark, let me also go back, of course, to Mikhail Marx and Associa General to try and figure out whether there, there are more sanctions coming and what exactly that means, uh, M Michaela, for Europe. I mean, the economy in Europe is really in, in a bit of a mess at the moment. It's, is an oil embargo next, oil and gas, and what does it mean for the economy? So in terms of the economic implications uh, of, of the war, it's clear that there is a concern now, both in terms of energy prices and in terms of energy supply. So I think those are the two critical factors moving forward. But if we look at the starting point from the economy, keep in mind that we were starting from a point where we still had a positive lift coming from the removal of pandemic restrictions. We still had a positive lift coming from the situation on the labor market. So as we look ahead, I think that we're looking at a, a year of lackluster growth in Europe. But the critical factor is what happens next to those energy prices and to the energy supply. And in such a situation, if we were to see much more of a price or supply shock, then indeed growth forecasts would be revised down substantially. Yeah, and of course this depends on what's happening in Ukraine and some of the humanitarian crisis and whether we see also more civilian killed. So, Mark, what can you tell us about how long this war could last and whether we're entering a new phase? Yes, I mean, this is the, the thing at the moment, but the real concern uh, among NATO allies is uh, we know that the Russians are refocusing in the east. We know that they've pull, they pulled their troops out from around Kiev and they're reconstituting them. So there's probably a window of uh, between one and three weeks or so um, in which for Ukraine to get ready. And so yesterday you had uh, NATO sort of finally starting to move uh, in terms of um, agreeing to, to provide the sort of large weaponry, the tanks and the APCs and artillery and so on, uh, that uh, the Ukrainians would need, because this will be a war fought in the open battlefield. Uh, it won't be an urban uh, campaign like in the suburbs of Kiev, where uh, the Ukrainians were able to uh, have a remarkable effect uh, just using anti-tank weapons. Uh, so now this will be a much more conventional war. Um, the foreign minister of Ukraine, uh, Dmitry Kulyeva, he described it as something more like World War II with you know, thousands of tanks involved. Uh, so it's a, it's a completely different stage of the war. Uh, we don't know how it will pan out because Russia has its own challenges. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the West, which is sort of the armory for Ukraine, is only just beginning to supply some of what's needed. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Champion there, of course, our experts on all things tactical and military at Bloomberg. And thank you as well to Michaela Marcus and Chief Economist at Société Générale joining me in Paris today. Now, coming up, Peter Thiel stands up for crypto and blasts what he calls the finance gerontocracy. More on that in the crypto world next. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Now, let's get on to a bit of crypto. Billionaire entrepreneur Peter Thiel has called Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon, and Larry Fink members of the finance gerontocracy. Now, he contrasts them with a revolutionary youth movement that embraces Bitcoin. Now, this is worse than being called the boomer. Uh, we're joined by Bloomberg's Justina Lee to walk us through exactly what happened. Justina, I mean, it's quite a fun story. I don't know how the, the billionaires will take it, but he basically made these comments at the Bitcoin conference currently underway in Miami. It's attracted many other crypto celebrities in the city. What are they up to there? 
I think one way to describe it is maybe it's some sort of religious Coachella um, for Bitcoin fans. And I, th I think it's important to put Teal's remarks in that context because he really is preaching to the choir there. And, you know, a lot of Bitcoin fans are finding a lot to be excited about because for all these years, they've been talking about Bitcoin being the perfect asset in a rising inflationary environment. Now, we haven't exactly seen that lately, but at least this is the macro fear they've been talking about. All right, Justina, thank you so much. I don't know what's worse, being called a boomer or a gerontocrat. We should put that poll actually on Twitter out there. I might do it now. Justina Lee, the very latest, latest on Peter Thiel and crypto. Coming up, we'll have the latest on the French election. Henry Wallach, deputy chief executive of polling firm Ipsos. He joins me here in freezing Paris next. This is Bloomberg. out in force again. Bullard warns the Fed may be behind the curve, calling for rates at 3% or more this year. Hunger warning. Well, the U.N. says food prices are hit another record high in March. Plus, the home stretch as France's presidential election looms. Polls show Emmanuel Macron's lead over Marine Le Pen narrowing further. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacla here in Paris. We're looking at the polls. We're looking at the race for the French presidency. They appear to be tightening ahead of Sunday's first round election. Now, the latest Ipsos poll of voting intentions showing President Emmanuel Macron's lead over Marine Le Pen narrowing to three and a half percentage points from five points in the previous survey. So we're joined now to look at the polls and what we could see in the second round by Henri Wallard. He's chairman of Ipsos France. Henri, thank you, first of all, for for joining us. It's windy, it's cold. It means that less people will probably show up and vote on Sunday. What are you worried about in terms of abstention, in terms of people that may not come up and vote, and who does it favor? We believe that the turnout will actually be lower than for the past presidential election, and we estimate the, the turnout will be between around 72 percent of people yeah. will, will go and vote. It is true that the weather, and especially the anticipated weather, that it's worse than expected for this season might um, um, make some people not go and vote. But overall, I think uh, it will be lower than last time. And again, we think about 72 people of the French voters will go and put a ballot. So, OK, so I, who's not going to vote? Because, you know, when you look at populism or what we've seen with the Trump phenomenon, but even Brexit, is that they managed to get voters that hadn't voted in 10, 15 years to go to the ballot. So if there is bad weather or if there's abstention, is it the left historically that have voted for some of these parties that won't show up or someone else? There are, there are some different profiles of the, of the voters. Uh, the young people tend to vote less than the older people, for instance, and as the younger and older people tend to vote a bit differently, it has sometimes an, an impact on what we call the differential turnout, so that according to the parties there are some differences. And it is true that there are some people who are at the edge of voting, who don't show up, that if they would show up, they would tend actually, as you said, to vote more for the so-called populist parties. OK, so there are about 12 candidates, of course, that people go and vote for on Sunday. Let's focus on the three main ones, which we have on screen. Emmanuel Macron, Marine Le Pen, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. I think Jean-Luc Mélenchon was polling around 17.5 percent. I mean, who could we have actually in the second round? Could it be a Marine Le Pen Macron? Could it be a Macron Mélenchon? Or could it even be a Le Pen Mélenchon? Or is that almost impossible? With the, with the data we have right now, uh, it's highly, highly likely that the scenario will be Marine Le Pen versus Emmanuel Macron for the second second run of this election. A, a repeat of 2017. Yes, and actually exactly the reverse than what people say they did not want a few months or a few years ago. We had polls in the past and we asked people, you know, uh, about the scenario and what they would uh, anticipate and prefer. And clearly lots of people were declaring they would rather not have the same match than last time. And actually this is what will happen. Do you trust the polls? Do you trust your own poll more now than you did in 2017? Are you we, polling differently? We, we trust the polls. I, I, I could speak at length and I've published not, uh, new papers about the reliability of the polls and academic people are, are searching on this. We do trust our polls, yes. But, but given the margin of error, it could mean that actually the, anyone could be president in, in you know, it could, we could, ha it's not impossible that Marine Le Pen becomes president. Yeah, that would yeah. then, of course, be the, the case for the second run of the election. Right now, we uh, anticipate uh, Macron about 
57 and uh, sorry, uh, uh, 53 and 47. It could be 42, uh, 52, 48. So it's true that it's a uh, close as ever edge between uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. Now, this being said, once the first run has happened, people will think again about their voting right. intent because when they realize it's for real that this is the match, it might influence some of the decisions uh, made by the voters. So, I, first of all, how many undecided voters do you think there will be between the first round and the second round? And what distills their mind? Is it debates? Is it policies? Or is a Marine Le Pen vote just an anti-Macron vote? They are, they are, they are two um, hesitations for people. One is vote or not vote, which is the first thing which drives you know, the turnout and the actual turnout. Why would people not vote? Because they don't think that it, has, it makes any impact. They don't believe it will make any change. As for some of the voters, they, they feel that whether they vote or, or don't vote doesn't make a difference. Okay. For those who vote, they actually, uh, we, we survey the French people and we see that a, a, a vast uh, majority of people do believe that politicians can change something for their life. And we can measure the credibility of the respective candidates about this. So for those who vote, they anticipate that it will have an impact for them or for the country. So we, we might expect that uh, in the second run, some people will think twice, and when they see a scenario where Marine Le Pen can be elected, some voters might be induced to go and actually put the ballot. So if Marine Le Pen were to become president in the next two weeks, so after the second round, where you only have two candidates, what voter does she have to try and get on her side? Is it the Eric Zemmour vote plus the smaller faction parties? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, we, we can see that uh, Marine Le Pen is capable to attract uh, a certain number of voters from Eric Zemmour. And uh, she's actually, um, she has a good, um, the voters of Eric Zemmour have a better opinion of Marine Le Pen than the voters of Marine Le Pen have as an opinion of Eric Zemmour. So Marine Le Pen has a, a, a higher capacity to attract voters from uh, Eric Zemmour's side, and yes, a, a certain number of voters from the uh, Pécresse uh, side, Pécresse supporters. Okay, Henri, thank you so much. I could speak to you for three hours, but it's too cold, and I know you have work to do. Henri Wallard, uh, chairman of Ipsos France, joining us this morning to game theory and try and understand the numbers and, of course, the polls. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Shanghai has reported more than 20,000 new COVID cases for the past 24 hours, marking its highest tally since the start of the pandemic. The city is racing to create isolation facilities as it sticks to a policy of quarantining all those positive for the virus, as well as everyone they have interacted with. Complaints are growing from residents about the strict nature of China's COVID zero strategy. Now, UK companies are rising starting salaries at their fastest pace on record. According to a regular survey by the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, March saw new joiner pay climb more than at any time since polling began back in 1997. Worsening labour shortages are giving workers unprecedented bargaining power with low unemployment and fewer European Union candidates, and this is all adding to the squeeze. In the US, Kajani Brown-Jackson has has been confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, making history as the first black woman ever to join its ranks. Jackson is a Harvard Law School graduate and a former public defender. She'll join the top U.S. court when Justice Stephen Breyer does retire this summer. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, we'll be speaking to Sandra Gozzi, a member of the European Parliament for Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the polls as we are two days away from the first round of voting for the presidential election here in Paris. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Now, Emmanuel Macron has spent the last week trying to connect with voters ahead of this Sunday's first round presidential election. But will it be enough to maintain what has become a narrowing lead over his main competitor, Marine Le Pen? Well, with us to try and answer all of that is Sandro Gozzi. He's a member of the European Parliament from the Renew Europe Group and member of Macron's La République En Marche party. So, Mr. Gozzi, thank you so much for joining us right here on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. First of all, talk to me a little bit about how, I guess, the closeness of Marine Le Pen in terms of the polls will change Mr. Macron's campaign um, in, in the next two weeks to go to the second round. Well, first of all, uh, first of all uh, now we are concentrating on the first round. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, the first round... Uh, it is, uh, according to the poll, it is no surprise to me because uh, that the trend uh, in France since uh, 2017. Uh, the trend in France that there are two big political offers which polarize the political system. One of uh, pro-European, uh, pro, I mean, uh, pro-reform, uh, which is uh, the Emmanuel Macron offer, and uh, a nationalist uh, anti-European offer, which is Marine Le Pen. So, I mean, uh, looking at the polls also that just, just showed, uh, before and you are showing now, uh, I would say that this is the trend today in, in France. So, I mean, it wasn't uh, an accident what happened in 2017. It is a real trend. So now we are concentrating, of right. course, to get the best result right. possible Mr. Gozzi, uh, this, uh, this Sunday. Yes. And then the but two weeks we will be another match. Minutes, Mr. Gozzi, yes? yeah, if we just spend a couple of minutes on that, I mean, you, you say it's a given that actually we're at the same place where we're in 2017, but would President Macron, should he have not done things better so that people didn't think that they would have to go uh, to someone who is anti-immigrant and anti-globalist because they're unhappy? Is there anything that Emmanuel Macron should have done better not to be in the situation in 2022? Well, he has said himself that, I mean, uh, the fact that uh, the populists are still strong is certainly something on which uh, we have to work more. Uh, on one side, I would say that Macron has convinced, uh, has convinced uh, uh, more than the, his voters in 2017 with the social and economic reform he has adopted. Look at the number for unemployment, for example, which has never been so low in the last 30 years, especially for young people, but in general. On the other side, it is clear that, I mean, this polarization has uh, uh, driven towards Macron new voters uh, and new uh, also political allies from the right and from the left. And on the other side, uh, the opposition to this, uh, also going through three major crises. Uh, I want to recall uh, the uh, Gilets jaunes crisis, uh, the health crisis, uh, and uh, now the right. Ukrainian crisis has uh, polarized those who are still are unsatisfied around Marine Le Pen. So I would say that uh, the M Macron has done what he has said in 2017. Uh, this has also provoked, I mean, a allowed uh, new support to him. But there is, a, a, I would say, a societal yeah. and social His polarization, uh, which has benefit to both. Uh, if uh, Mr. Gozzi, the polls you show are right, to he Macron and to Le Pen, and at the expenses of all the yes. other parties, which I, I, uh, they look uh, really out His of the race. His critics. Yeah. Mr. Gozzi, his critics say that he should have run for president earlier, that he's out of touch and he's seen as too elitist. After the first round on Sunday, what can he do to try and regain the confidence? Again, it, it's almost a, it was almost a given up until two weeks ago that he'd be president. Did he assume that too much? Was he too complacent about it? Well, it's not a question of complacency. It's a question of war. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron is the president of one of the most important countries in Europe and in the world during a war in Europe. And so he hasn't chosen uh, to do more president than he should have been. Uh, it is uh, the um, world, world reality, the global reality, the Ukrainian tragedy was pushing uh, to, I mean, devote uh, most of his time to uh, act, uh, to be a, a, pre a president and not to be, uh, to be a candidate. So, I mean, I would say that this is, I mean, it, it wasn't a choice and it would have been a, 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 a harshly criticized if he had done the opposite. So, right. uh, it is clear that, I mean, after the 10th of April, it will be a new race, it will be a new match, and it will be two uh, weeks of very intensive campaign. And I expect Macron to be... Uh, uh, very, uh, very intensively 
uh, in the campaign, and I trust him because uh, in the one-to-one -one duel, is very effective. And he's got also strong argument on his side, I mean, of right. results and of credible programs for Gozzi. the next five years. Yeah, I want to come back to actually this idea that, you know, he's being a president and what that means for his popularity, because we saw the opposite effect with Boris Johnson in the UK, where his rating went up because he's dealing with the war. I also need to bring you up today with some breaking news out of the Bank of Russia, cutting the key rate by 300 basis points to 17 percent. Of course, we've seen the governor there, Madame Naibulina, trying to engineer the economy with what she had left just to try and cushion the economy in a very very difficult situation. We follow every news coming out of Ukraine as well. You can see dollar ruble 79.40. Uh, Ukraine also saying that dozens have been killed in a Russian attack on a railway station. So we'll see exactly where uh, and what that means for possible retaliation over the last 24 hours. We've also had a number, of course, of extra sanctions put on Russia, both from the EU but also from the U.S. We'll be back with Sandra Gozi, member of the European Parliament, of course, from the Renew Europe Group and a member of Macron's La République En Marche shortly. But first, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, I think, with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Credit Agricole has required a minority stake in Italy's Banco BPM as the lender expands further into its second largest market. The French bank says a 9.18% holding strengthens a solid relationship with Italy's third biggest lender. The purchase will spark speculation of a takeover amid the rapid consolidation of the Italian banking sector. Now, Rio Tinto has taken full control of an Australian alumina refinery it owns with Roussel, formally removing access to a key source of raw material for the Russian aluminium giant. Roussel owned 20 percent of the joint venture Queensland Aluminia. However, it's been unable to access its share of production since last month when Australia banned alumina exports to Russia. And Toshiba shares have gained in Tokyo after the company said it would scrap plans to split in two and instead consider strategic alternatives, including bids to take the company private. The embattled Japanese firm has been struggling to regain its footings after years of scandals and mismanagement missteps. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Liam, thank you so much. Now, we're back in Paris. It's cold, it's rainy. It'll probably affect voter turnout, and that, in effect, could actually give or change the course of who becomes president of France. Now, we're back with Sandro Gozzi. He's a member of the European Parliament from the Renew Europe Group. We were talking, uh, Mr. Gozzi, of course, about why Emmanuel Macron's popularity has dwindled, despite the fact that there's a war, and traditionally, when a president is seen to be doing enough in battling a war, gives them a boost like it did with Boris Johnson in the UK. How can you explain this? Well, I mean, I, uh, to, be, to be honest with you, uh, if uh, one year ago you had told me that uh, in the first round, the last poll of Boom Bloomberg gives Macron a 27 percent of support, I would have been extremely happy. Uh, because uh, it is always extremely difficult uh, for the president, the outgoing, the incumbent president uh, uh, in France uh, uh, to have such a rate of approval uh, um, uh, on, the eve, uh, on the eve of the presidential election. So I would say that, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the numbers uh, are certainly numbers which are uh, positive uh, for, for, for him. Uh, uh, the, the Ukrainian war has a, has a double effect. Uh, first, he had, uh, he had got the effect you are referring to, uh, because at the outbreak of the war, uh, the support for the president, for the current president, was uh, for Macron, was uh, over uh, 30 percent. Uh, we have also touched to 32, 33 percent, uh, and that is the normal effect you are referring mm -hmm. to. Now, I mean, there is an issue. Uh, the issue is uh, uh, the economic effect of the sanctions. And people are starting to be mm -hmm. worried in France and in other countries, but, I mean, we are talking about France, about the economic uh, consequences right. of the sanctions. And this is why uh, we, have, we don't have to be ambiguous. 
towards Russia or towards Putin, as Marine Le Pen is. Uh, Marine Le Pen is extremely ambiguous, not only politically, but also yeah. economically in terms of sanctions uh, towards Putin and towards the Russian aggression. We have on one side to continue uh, this uh, strategy of increasing sanctions against Putin to stop the bloody aggression of Ukraine, but mm -hmm. on the other side, we have uh, to work at French level. The government has already done, has already taken important social economic measures and also in the sector of energy. But we have also at European level to come Thank up you. with uh, a plan, a plan yeah. to, uh, to face the negative economic consequences. Of I would say that this is the main reason uh, of the attitude of the voters in, this day, in these days of and the also of their living. uncertainty. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Gozi, Sandro Gozi, there, a member of European Parliament from the Renew Europe Group and a member of Macron's La République En Marche party joining us this morning for Strasbourg. Now, coming up, inflation is not just showing up at the petrol pump, it's hitting people at the dinner table as well. It goes back to what we're talking about here in Europe with uh, Mr. Gozi about the fact that it's really the cost of living that is putting so much anxiousness in the European voter. We'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Now, data out earlier this hour shows that global food prices are surging at the fastest pace ever. The war in Ukraine choking supplies of crops, piling more inflationary pressures on worsening global hunger crises. Well, let's turn now to Bloomberg's agriculture reporter, Megan Durison. Albury, Megan, uh, thank you for joining us. I mean, the results at a record high was pretty much expected. When do they get better? Yeah, I mean, so the results today, like you said, they're at a record, and not only that, but at a rising at a record pace. I mean, the food price index jumped more than 12 percent in March. That's a huge increase. Um, and the, like you said, it's really unclear when this is going to ease. Um, Ukraine is such a vital part of the global food supply chain, um, and I, it's pretty clear that their plantings will likely be reduced for the harvest going forward as well. I mean, the challenges, of course, are the war in Ukraine, the, you know, the, the hotbed for also some of the wheat and some of the softer commodity producers. Do the supply chains change? Are there other parts of the world that can actually put grains on the ground to feed the world? Yeah, so the FAO's data today showed some other countries like India, the EU, um, parts of the Americas are stepping in to help fill the gap, uh, especially for the losses in wheat and uh, corn exports. But it's still, it's not enough. It doesn't fully cover the, the losses from Ukraine. Um, the agency cut its outlook for Ukraine wheat exports by 5 million tons, corn by more than 12 million tons. They're also cutting back the outlook for Russia due to freight and financing challenges there. So all in all, we're still seeing uh, some tightening in global supply. Okay, Megan, thanks so much. Our Bloomberg agriculture reporter, Megan Durison Albury. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, from Paris. We're just two days away from the first round of the French presidential election. Also, Bloomberg surveillance early edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York, Danny Berger in London. This is Bloomberg. very quickly from uh, from exuberance on growth to, to now gloom. We've had two generational shocks. When Wall Street gets bearish, that's generally a sign to get bullish. We think the U.S. is in a more resilient state than many other parts of the world. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, April 8th, our top stories today. It's a race to rearm as the war in Ukraine enters a new phase. Ukraine pleads with NATO for more weapons, and Russian forces try to regroup after being pushed out of the Kyiv area. Also, in the last few minutes, Ukraine saying dozens killed in a Russian attack on a railway station. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visits Kyiv today as German Chancellor Olaf Scholz meets in London with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Meanwhile, the race tightens days before France prepares to go vote in the first round of presidential elections. President Macron's lead over Marine Le Pen has gotten smaller. 
and a whirlwind of activity on Capitol Hill. Congress heads for recess after blocking Russian energy imports and stripping Moscow of normal trade status. Plus, the Senate confirms Katanji Brown Jackson to be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, it has been a bumpy week, really bookmarked by Fed speak, but today it feels people happy to take at least a little bit of risk with them into the weekend. A little bit, Danny, and I would emphasize a little bit. At least that was definitely true in the Asian session overnight, where we saw relatively small moves. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole only up about two tenths of one percent. Really small moves across Japan, China, and Hong Kong. The big laggards, though, within Hong Kong were technology stocks. The Hang Seng Tech Index down a little more than one percent as regulators formally kicked off a campaign to rein in abuse of algorithms by tech companies like Tencent. So it is all about that regulatory ever, uh, overhang still for a lot of these companies. Companies. I also wanted to point to Indian assets. You had the RBI out overnight hiking its inflation forecast dramatically due to higher uh, commodity prices, also uh, outlining the path for policy normalization. And as a result, you actually have the Indian rupee, the only Asian currency stronger against the U.S. dollar. It isn't too much change, trading right around 75.94. Uh, but of course, you saw a big change in the Indian bond market. That 10-year yield up 14 basis points to the highest since 2019, Matt. All right, very interesting stuff. We saw some curves steepening yesterday. That's coming back in a little bit today, but we're still seeing gains in futures, and we closed higher on the cash trade yesterday, about four-tenths of a percent on the S&P, about a quarter percent on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Right now, you see the 10-year yield rising just a little bit, two spots, six, seven, nine, two, but to relatively high levels, and that's uh, part of the steepening that we saw yesterday. NYMEX crude up about four-tenths of one percent. It's not moving very much, but 96.43 is the level for TI. We're still seeing Brent trade over $100 a barrel, and Bitcoin coming back a little bit. So this is, Kaylee and Danny, your little bit of risk <laughs> that investors are willing to take with them into the weekend in the form of Bitcoin, $43,741. What do you see in terms of European markets, Danny? Well, I'm going to kind of blow up this narrative that I maybe kicked us off with because it actually <laughs> does look like investors are willing to take a sizable chunk of European equities with them into the weekend. The main benchmark, it's up more than 1%. Most of the regions are up more than 1% as well, save for the FTSE 100. That's up just nine tenths of a percent. But still, it's a pretty optimistic session given that to start the week, the Euro stock 600 had been falling. So maybe it's the fact that those bond losses have eased ever so slightly, especially especially in Europe. But one of the interesting things I want to point out with, are with these gains, you're seeing French stocks gain. Now, we have the first round of elections this weekend. We're going to talk to Francine Lacroix about that in just a moment. But I was talking to Laura Cooper of BlackRock earlier, who said investors aren't appropriately pricing this in. They aren't hedged enough. And I think today underscores that. France had been underperforming this week, but now it looks to be um, outperforming today. There is a little bit of selling when it comes to oats to French tenures, uh, but not that much, about a basis point higher higher in yields. Now that spread between French and German bond yields that has been widening, but it looks nothing like it did during the 2017 election. So again, are people appropriately hedged going into a race where the polls have started to tighten against Macron and Le Pen? Now finally, a stronger dollar. We are headed for the longest losing streak for the euro since 2016. Pound also weaker. And then a check on your Russian assets. Now the ruble is gaining today despite the fact that just moments ago a decision from the Central Bank of Russia to cut 300 basis points. This wasn't a scheduled meeting. Their scheduled meeting is April 29th, and they also signaled this decision that they would cut yet again. So it really shows that the Russian Central Bank is trying to do what they can to stem some of the damage to the economy. But of course, we've seen a lot of these assets really be able to hold onto their ground. But still, that is changing ever so slightly in reaction to the Central Bank decision. For example, Russian bonds selling off down about three basis points, Kaylee. Well, and Danny, we're also getting breaking news in the form of Russian sanctions. First from Japan, the Prime Minister Kishida is speaking in Tokyo saying that Japan will ban, ban imports of Russian coal, of course, following the lead of the European Union. Then some headlines out of the UK as well. They're adding 
President Vladimir Putin of Russia's daughters to the sanctions list. So we continue to get the incremental updates uh, on retaliatory measures against Russia. Now, we'll have more on geopolitics throughout the day today. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky will be speaking to Finnish Parliament at 6 a.m. New York time. Then later, Zelensky will be meeting with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen when she visits him in person in Kyiv today. And, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, of course, also on the move. He'll be meeting with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson in Downing Street around 7.30 a.m. New York time. We'll get the April USDA World Agricultural Supply and Demand Report at noon New York time. Uh, and of course, that is following food prices that we learned this morning are at a fresh record, a massive increase. And of course, in golf, the Masters Tournament will continue in Augusta, Georgia. Tiger Woods Ooh. back on the green. I believe he <laughs> shot one under par yesterday, yes, Matt. Yes, he did. I'll be watching that very closely this weekend. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not all about golf this weekend. The war in Ukraine rages on, entering a new phase. Six weeks after Russian President Vladimir Putin launched the invasion, Russian forces are expected to regroup after being pushed out of the area around Kiev. And Ukraine has pleaded with NATO to send more military aid. Ukraine says at least 27 people were killed and 30 others wounded in a Russian rocket strike on a railway station being used for evacuating civilians in the country. Let's get to our global team coverage from Paris and Washington. Let's start with Chad Thomas. He's Bloomberg's Western Europe executive editor. Um, he is in our Paris bureau right now, typically stationed in Berlin, my old boss. Chad, what can we expect today from German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's visit to London? Hi, Matt. We'll be watching this visit very closely uh, to see if uh, Chancellor Schultz or uh, Prime Minister Johnson, what they have to say on additional sanctions. Of course, we had the sanctions announced overnight uh, by the EU that they will uh, ban uh, the use of coal, also putting restrictions on the use of ports and uh, trucks coming into the EU from Russia. Why does this really matter? Because it's Germany who makes the decisions ultimately on how far the EU will go on sanctions. Uh, two things that were not on the list, uh, latest list that came out was oil and gas. Uh, Germany mm -hmm. is very dependent on Russian oil and gas. And so we'll be watching closely to see what the two of them have to say in terms of where we go next uh, with sanctions from both the UK and the EU. How much political pressure is Olaf Scholz facing to change his tone when it comes to gas, to actually act on gas, either from allies or also from the domestic population within Germany? Yeah, it's a real mix on that because on the one hand, there is incredible pressure from uh, some of the other members of the EU who want the EU to move more quickly on oil and gas. Uh, Germany uh, domestically is, is very split. There are many people uh, in the public who say it's time to move on these things as well. However, uh, German industry has warned that uh, removing uh, German, stopping the use of Russian uh, gas in Germany would have uh, dire consequences for industry. Uh, Germany gets, of course, more than 50 percent of its gas from Russia. And so uh, he's under pressure really from all sides uh, on what next steps he will take when it comes to both oil and gas. Chad, thank you for the update. That's Bloomberg's Chad Thomas. Now to France, where the race for the French presidency appears to be tightening ahead of Sunday's first round election. The latest polls show President Emmanuel Macron's lead over Marine Le Pen has narrowed to 3.5 percentage points. That's from five points in the previous survey. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix is leading our coverage in Paris. Francine, 3.5 percentage points. How real is it that come the next round of elections that Le Pen uh, is the president of France. Well, uh, good morning, Danny. First of all, I'm frozen on a rooftop, not <laughs> insignificant for the election because it could affect voter turnout. If people watch Bloomberg, they say, ah, it's going to be bad weather on Sunday. I won't go and vote. You could see those numbers change. On Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron, Danny, I think the way to put it is that it's pretty improbable at the moment that Marine Le Pen becomes president. But given the narrowing of the polls, it's not impossible. Now, there are a couple of things that we need to think about. First of all, what do people want? What do the voters worry about the 
the most. And that, without a doubt, is a cost of living. Uh, other critics, of course, of Emmanuel Macron saying he's very elitist, he doesn't speak to the people as well as Marine Le Pen. And there is a sense that she would take care of the common French person a bit more through spending. This will have huge implications, of course, on the economy. And polls fluctuate. I spoke to a pollster about half an hour ago. He assured me that they are right, but there is still this margin of error. So if we focus on the many candidates that people will have to choose for on Sunday, it's probably uh, the three top ones that will be, of course, the runners off in the second round. This is the way that the French presidential vote goes. And so we could either have an Emmanuel Macron, Marine Le Pen, or maybe an Emmanuel Macron, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, although that seems much more difficult. And then we look at to round two, April 24th. You know, I would recommend a hat of some sort, Francine. <laughs> like a Bavarian hunting cap um, would be would be nice and, and warm. I wonder I, about the. Um, it'd be the, blown uh, away. <laughs> yes, that's very likely. It sounds windy. I wonder about the um, the position of the far right in France on NATO, on working with allies, on Russia. Would that change anything in terms of the war in Ukraine? I mean, it probably would if Marine Le Pen got elected president of France. First, you have to see the majority that she'd have in parliament. And for that, we look to elections in June. But she is quite ambivalent when it comes to President Putin. We had Eric Zemmour, who's even more to the far right of Marine Le Pen, who is very clearly uh, not wanting to condemn uh, Mr. Putin. And that lost him popularity. Marine Le Pen in the past was very friendly with him. Now she's kind of staying on the fence, focusing more on what she'd do to help uh, the French you know, with this, of course, cost of living crisis. But you're absolutely right, um, Matt. It's probably on foreign policy that it would change uh, quite dramatically. Also, uh, she has been widely seen as anti-globalist. What does that mean for supply chains and what does it mean for France's role within Europe? She's also seen as being a high spender for support of the French people. How she manages, of course, to fund this deficit yeah. is one of the big questions that the markets will have to try and answer if she gets further in the polls. All right, Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua in a windy and cold but still beautiful Paris. Thank you so much. And of course, Francine will be back with us later on this hour with Benjamin Malmont, uh, global CIO at Edmund de Rothschild. And also be sure to tune in for a, our special coverage of the French election this Sunday right here on Bloomberg TV. Now let's head from Paris to Washington. Before heading to recess, Congress overwhelmingly voted to strip Russia's normal trade status and ban imports of its gas, oil and coal. Meanwhile, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan has been postponed after she tested positive for coronavirus. Let's get to Bloomberg government reporter Emily Wilkins in Washington, D.C. for more. Emily, I want to focus on Taiwan because we got a response to reports of that trip from China overnight and it was scathing. Yes, this was a very strong statement. And let's just lay out the timeline here. Uh, we started hearing reports that Pelosi would be making this trip around Wednesday evening. Then we did hear the response from Beijing. Uh, they said they called the trip a sneaky trip that would constitute a gross interference in its international affairs and an extremely dangerous political signal to the outside world. So very strong rhetoric there. And then come Thursday, we learned that Speaker Nancy Pelosi had tested positive for COVID. COVID. This is coming as we are seeing a lot of COVID cases in D.C. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, Senator Susan Collins. And it does also come as Congress is facing this two-week break. So Pelosi is going to have time to recover. Uh, she was also at the White House this past week, photographed being very close to President Biden. But the White House has said that the contact the two had is not enough that Biden needs to quarantine. They say that he is still testing negative at this time. Well, I'm I guess her, this 82-year-old um, woman's COVID case is helpful in terms of foreign relations because now she's not going to Taiwan. In terms of um, the historic moment that we watched yesterday, Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson making, uh, um, well, becoming the first black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court, and she even got some votes uh, from the other side of the aisle. Yes, three Republicans voted in support of Katanji Brown Jackson. Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and Mitt Romney all backed her nomination there. It really was a historic moment. You saw the first black vice, pre 
for first black female Vice President Kamala Harris be the one to sort of gavel in the vote, declare that she had been officially confirmed. But it is going to be a minute before we see Judge Jackson become Justice Jackson. Uh, Judge Justice Stephen Beyer, who she's going to be replacing on the court, he's not going to step down until about late June, early July. And so she's got about a three-month span of time. But we know that Majority Leader Chuck Schumer in the Senate, he told the Biden administration that he thought it would be best if they really expedited mm. her confirmation process through the Senate, kind of strike while the iron is hot. So now that's done, but it's, it's going to be a minute before we actually see her up there on the bench with the Supreme Court. All right, Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government down in Washington for us. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading in the U.S. One outperformer is CrowdStrike. The company setting a $5 billion annual recurring revenue target by 2026. Analysts really positive on that news. That stock is up 4% as a result. One stock moving lower, though, is Robinhood. Yes, it rolled out its cryptocurrency wallet to 2 million users yesterday, but this morning getting cut to sell at Goldman Sachs. $13 price target put on the stock is trading at 1172 this morning, down about 3%. And one other stock moving lower that I wanted to mention, and of course it was a big gainer of yesterday, HP. It was up more than 11% yesterday on news that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway had taken a $4.2 billion stake in the company. Giving a little bit of that back though this morning, Danny, lower by the better part of 2% before the bell. It has been a weird 24 hours for Warren Buff Buffett. I'm sure you and <laughs> both you and Matt saw Peter yep. Thiel calling him a sociopathic grandpa from Omaha at the latest Bitcoin conference. Can't wait to see how you and Matt cover that on the next edition of Bloomberg Crypto. Well, coming up here, more on the markets and the French election. We're going to be live in Paris with Benjamin Me Melman, global CIO at Edmund de Rothschild. And the race to rearm. We'll discuss how weapons could define the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Plus, the $430 billion habit that got Japan's central bank hooked on ETFs. Read more of today's Big Take by typing NI Big Take Go onto your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. I'm Matt Miller here in New York um, with Kaylee Lines, Danny Berger with us out of London. Anna Edwards is off this week. I am looking at the U.S. dollar right now. It's the highest level that we've seen since about July, I think, of July of 2020. Um, and Kriti Gupta, who writes our chart of the day, uh, featured this yesterday in terms of uh, her, what is it, 2509 was the number? 2504. 2504. So if you want to look it up on the Bloomberg terminal, uh, uh, B hashtag, G hashtag BTV space 2504. What are you seeing in the dollar? Because we, we see continued strength today. Yeah, well, what's interesting about the dollar here is that in theory, uh, post-recessionary periods in the chart that you really just showed, was that post-recessionary period, essentially the dollar should come back out, right? Because in 2020, it surged the way it did in 2008. But you're not seeing that this time around. And a lot of that is a combination of a little bit of haven flows. You do want that exposure to the United States as kind of this uh, geopolitical haven in particular. But also the idea uh, that you do have these rate differentials. And that's yeah. what's really driving the dollar right now. Also, the kind of bull case of the United States and how they might weather mm -hmm. these inflation prices relative to the rest of the world. So you have the stronger dollar. You have oil prices that have cooled off relatively substantially. You also yeah. have a 10-year real yield. That last I check is sitting around negative 16 basis points. Right. So it is much less negative than it was before. How does all of that influence U.S. equities? Um, it's not influencing it too much yet because we're still waiting for it to turn positive, right? Because one of the base cases is... The real yield. The real yield. So, but th yeah. That's not bullish stocks, right? If the yeah. real yield in turns theory. positive, um, people right. would migrate over. It's to the to bonds. In yeah. theory, unless you are pricing in an extremely hawkish Fed, then you have to kind of reconsider, do you actually Good want point. exposure yeah. to the bond market? So for now, until we still see that real yield turn positive, it is still bullish for stocks. And simply, there is no alternative, a legacy of the pandemic. That being said, you totally bring up a good point because it is about asset allocation. And we have seen a kind of calls for the end of the bond bull market mm -hmm. at a time when the rest of the world is still struggling with extremely high inflation, protests around the world, um, and a lack of kind of organic growth catalyst, whereas the United States is far better positioned for it. So in times of crisis, where does the rest of the world flock? And that tends to be U.S. Treasury. So there is a bull case for U.S. Treasuries. 
Kriti, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta with Tina still in the building. And of course, for more from market analysis and live go on your terminal, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in London. Well, Matt, let's talk golf. He's four shots behind the leader after the first round. Still, it was Tiger Woods' day at the Masters. Woods shot a one under par 71 in his first round of competitive golf in 17 months. The five-time Masters champion has been recovering from a car crash that nearly cost him his right leg, let alone yeah. his life, Matt. I know where you'll be this weekend, on your couch with a beer with the Masters on TV. <laughs> yes, a few, but yeah, for sure. He almost died and he almost lost those legs. So it's amazing that he could deal with those grueling conditions and still come out one under. I, I think I'm speaking for us all when I say, go Tiger. <laughs> we'll be back with the markets <laughs> next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. Here's what you need to know. The war in Ukraine is entering a new phase. It's likely that Ukraine has just weeks to acquire and deploy new weapons for fighting in the eastern part of the country. Russian forces are expected to regroup after being pushed out of the area around Kyiv. Ukraine says at least 27 people were killed and 30 others were wounded in a Russian rocket strike on a railway station. In France, the latest polls show President Emmanuel Macron beating far-right candidate Marine Le Pen 52 to 48 in a runoff in this month's election. Macron's lead is slightly less than it was the previous day, but he's expected to finish on top in the first round of voting this Sunday with Le Pen second. And a whirlwind of activity on Capitol Hill. Congress heads for recess after blocking Russian energy imports and stripping Moscow of normal trade status. Plus, the Senate confirms Katanji Brown Jackson to be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. I'm Danny Berger in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. And Matt, it's Friday. Give us some good news. Is there any cheer in this market heading into the weekend? Well, well it does seem to be a little bit risk on, and we had uh, a, a higher finish in the cash trade yesterday. So the S&P futures are up just about two-tenths of 1% right now, um, and we're seeing uh, investors let go of government debt. So they're selling the 10-year bond. That's letting the yield float up to two spots, six, seven, five, four, Percent. NYMEX crude is up 1.2%, but it's still holding below uh, $100 a barrel. 97.15 is a level for TI. We do see more than 100 for the global benchmark Brent. And Bitcoin is rising a bit as well, um, even after Peter Thiel made some mean and nasty comments about our friend Warren Buffett. Up a quarter percent <laughs> to 43,694. You can't say something that mean about someone that old. I don't think you're allowed to. <laughs> well, talk to Peter Thiel about that. And it wasn't just Warren Buffett. Jamie Dimon was in there, too. I wonder how well, he feels. Of course, you were just talking about Bitcoin, Matt. Robinhood launched a cryptocurrency wallet yesterday to 2 million users. The stock, though, is lower in pre-market trading by a little more than 3%. Goldman Sachs cutting it to sell with a $13 price target this morning trading at 11.69. Other movers to the downside include HP. Remember, it had a big update yesterday. It was up more than 11% on news that Warren Buffett, who we were just speaking about, took a uh, huge stake in the company, about 4 $2 billion, but it's giving some of that gain back this morning, down about 1.4%. Of course, the other big stake story of the week, and I can't believe it actually was this week. It has felt very, very long, Danny. Elon Musk taking a 9.2% active stake in Twitter. Twitter is heading for its best day since uh, best week since last February, but it is a little softer in early hours this Friday morning, down about six tenths of 1%. And finally, to the upside, speaking of Elon Musk, Tesla is a little bit higher, up about six tenths. Of course, you're seeing uh, tech broadly uh, doing okay today today, even in the face of higher real yields, Danny. Kaylee, you literally could have told me that Elon Musk Twitter story happened a month ago, and I would have believed you. I right? also cannot keep track of time. <laughs> well, here in Europe, we are seeing some sizable gaining into the end of the week. Not only did it not gain when the U.S. did yesterday, uh, so it's kind of a game of catch-up to some extent. But one thing I want to highlight, yes, Europe's stock 600 is up 1%, but in France, the Cacaron is up 1.3%. Investors buying French stocks as we head into the polls, into the French presidential election, that will get more into 
to in just a moment, but France had been underperforming this week, and now it's outperforming. We're also seeing OAT's French 10-year. That is mostly holding its ground. We've seen spreads widen between France and German bond yields. Uh, at the moment, not too much of that happening. Perhaps most of it is baked into the picture at this moment. And finally, you're looking at a euro that's on track for its longest losing streak since 2016. Now, when it comes to Russian assets, again, these markets are, are very strange. They're kind of hard to really capture whether these are real moves or not, considering they're very limited markets. But we did hear from the Bank of Russia, the Central Bank of Russia, saying that they would cut interest rates 300 basis points in a surprise meeting. Their next meeting comes April 29th. They say they're expecting to cut rates again. We are seeing some declines in the, in the equity benchmark and the ruble also turning to losses, but ever so slightly. But the real move here, Matt, are Russian 10-year bonds uh, selling off lower by about six basis points. Yeah, all, well, uh, ruble below 80 for a dollar, I think, is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Danny, thanks very much for that. Let's get back to Paris right now. Um, as France gears up for its presidential election on Sunday, Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix is standing by with Benjamin Melman. He's the global chief investment officer at Edmond de Rothschild Asset Management. Francine? Yeah, Matt, it's only in the last couple of days, given the narrowing of the polls between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen, that the market kind of sat up and took notice of the possibility of Emmanuel Le Pen as president and what that means for yields, what that means for spending, and, of course, what that means for certain sectors. We are joined by Benjamin, and I'm delighted to be joining you uh, to try and understand, really, the implications of what this presidential race is. I know there's a lot of focus on the parliamentary than election in June, but if Marine Le Pen becomes president with power, what does that mean for the markets? What does that mean, sorry? For the markets. Yeah, well, um, it would be a, a sea change. It would be a sea change because the market has not been very prepared to, to such an event. Um, there would be two, two kind of issues. The first one would be on the economic side yeah. and how she would finance our economic programs. So some, um, some question would be raised and would be discussed with the new parliament. And the question would be what kind of majority she would have. It would be very difficult for her to have a majority at the parliament. Mm -hmm. So that would be a question on, yeah. on that issue. And the other question, which in our view is the most important one, is on Europe. Right. Um, because if she's not anymore the Frexit candidate, yeah. she has some proposition on Europe, which could be uh, some hot... Uh, it, it would certainly be hot topic. So part of it, if you look into into detail on some of the policies, of course, it'd be a closed border. It's not a Frexit, but it, it could evolve into something uh, similar. And certainly it would stop European integration. What does that mean for the French economy? Well, for the French economy, it would be... The impact wouldn't be uh, immediate. It would take some time to, to have an impact on the French economy. But it could have a, a confidence shock because... Um, the way um, France is, is, uh, is working is, is on confidence. France uh, has a lot of uh, foreign investment, and uh, the question would uh, see to, to see how foreign investors would deal with France in such uh, an environment. So it could have an impact, but not a short-term impact, more a medium-term impact. Benjamin, when you look at how this would change, actually the second term for Emmanuel Macron, how many more reforms will we do? Will the CAC 40 outperform, given the cost of living crisis, given the, the higher gas prices and the fact that whoever's president has to deal with that first? Yes. Well, um, it, it, the, the question of the purchasing power uh, has been very important and uh, has been so important that uh, we can understand why the polls are, are so tight today. It would be very important issues, but there are no easy answers in France due to the high public deficit. And uh, if now we are in a different context in Europe, where you have more time in order to reduce your uh, public deficit, you, you will have to reduce the public deficit, and there is no magic trick, what, whatever the president. In terms of investments right now, in a rising rate environment with an inverted yield curve and the Fed ready to sell off over a trillion dollars worth of bonds. Do you have to be careful? S 
But, but uh, the, the so, question sorry. was actually on QE, on the fact that actually because the Fed is rebalancing the balance sheet, because the ECB is getting out of QE, what does it mean for, for bond yields and what does it mean for, again, specifically maybe some of the fixed income in France? Yes. Well, the, the fact that the ECB is tapering is putting some pressure on, on uh, European spreads. And we have seen some significant spreads widening in Europe. Um, so far, the movement has been uh, progressive. But if we have some political events, such as yeah. the one we have been discussing, um, it could um, enhance the kind of spreads widening we are seeing in Europe. And to be honest, um, in our portfolios, we tend to be more cautious on European spreads. Benjamin, to Matt's very good question, do you feel now, when you look at your portfolios, that the Fed is actually central banker to the world? Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. We, we, we know that the, the Fed is ruling the main ma markets and also the European market. But still, as we were talking about the European spread, the ECB is having a lot of impact on the European spread, also on the credit spreads. Okay, we started the year with a lot of investors saying, look, this may be the year that Europe does better because valuations were cheaper. We're now, you know, 39 days into a war in Ukraine. Everyone's saying, why would you hold European stocks because of the proximity to Ukraine and Russia? They'll be hit the hardest. Yes. Well, it's true that um, Europe is so... It, we thought at the beginning of the year that it would be the European equity years. And unfortunately, we had the Ukraine uh, event. And it's true that so far, we don't know yet how the European growth will evolve. We suspect that EPS earnings will be, be revised significantly downward in Europe. It has not been the case so far. Uh, there is a small risk, not that high in our view, that Europe could face a recession. And in terms of profit, it's quite uh, possible. So we tend to remain more cautious on European equities in that kind of environment. And the fact that the Ukraine war lasts is not a positive factor. All right, Benjamin, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you sticking it out in the cold rain in Paris. Um, Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix and Benjamin Melman, their global chief investment officer at Edmund de Rothschild Asset Management. Stay with Bloomberg for our special coverage of the election. France decides that Sunday at 2 p.m. in New York, 7 p.m. in London, if you're watching the MotoGP, you can just switch back and forth. This <laughs> is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, Canada's finance minister, Christia Freeland. That's at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. What we do is, of course, to you now really watch carefully what will it take to maintain the effect of these sanctions, because the Russians, they try to find a way around it. So, you know, we, we do what it takes to maintain the effects uh, of the sanction on ground. And, of course, looking if, uh, if cryptocurrencies is being used as a way to escape. EU Commission Executive Vice President Marguerite Versailles discussing sanctions on Russia. That's as the war in Ukraine is entering a new phase six weeks after Russian President Vladimir Putin launched the invasion. It's likely that Ukraine has just weeks to acquire and deploy new weapons for fighting in the eastern part of the country. Russian forces are expected to regroup after being pushed out of the area around Kyiv. Ukraine has pledged with pleaded with NATO to send more military aid. Therese Raphael, Therese Raphael, Bloomberg Opinion Editor, joins us now for more. She had a great opinion piece out on the Bloomberg Terminal on this yesterday. I encourage everyone to read it. Is this so much an issue of willingness to supply weapons to Ukraine as it is one of just expediency? I think there was an issue of willingness until really very recently in the sense that, I mean, since 2014, NATO has been supplying Ukraine with certain weaponry. It's been training Ukrainian soldiers. But the emphasis at the start of the war, and I would say in the first phase of it, has been to supply Ukraine with defensive weapons, with, uh, you know, there's been the, the javelins, uh, we've seen drones, uh, anti-aircraft um, missiles. Now we are entering a whole new phase of the war. We've seen Russia 
recalibrate. Uh, it has taken the measure of Ukraine's forces. It's met with far more resistance than it expected. And the war is now shifting to the east, where Russia has a number of advantages. It can supply its troops faster. Um, it's harder to get reinforcements to Ukrainian forces. There's less air support. Now the need is for um, replenishing Ukrainian weapon supplies, which is one problem, getting them uh, new kinds of uh, different kinds of weapons to combat Russian forces in the Donbass and particularly to repel a sort of pincer movement between the north and the south uh, and in an attempt to surround Ukraine forces. NATO now seems to be very up for doing that. We've heard it from uh, Jens Stoltenberg. We've heard it from also the U.S. administration. But there are other questions of how to do it, logistics, what platforms mm. to use. So, and, and time is obviously very much of the essence, yeah. um, given that we've got about a week before uh, this is expected um, to really intensify. Are, are we done, you think, just messing around with switchblade drones? I heard Admiral Stravidis yesterday on NPR saying it's very clear what Ukraine needs. They need MiGs, which they can get from Poland. They need S-300 anti-missile defense systems, which they can get from Slovakia. They need cruise missiles, which they can get from the Czechs. Those are the weapons weapons, weapons, and weapons that they need, is our NATO countries going to be willing to supply them with those? Yeah, it's really not so simple because, um, for example, the Czechs are supplying Soviet-era T-72 tanks. Uh, those work very well. The Czechs can also supply the parts for them. But there are weapon systems that require training. Uh, that training has to happen off Ukraine uh, Ukrainian soil. Not only do they require training, they require maintenance. Um, and, you know, all of those things take time. So part of what NATO has to do now is figure out which platforms, uh, you know, Ukraine can use going forward and how quickly they can get some of those weapons into Ukrainian hands. Um, I think there's a lot of contention around whether MiGs would be uh, useful right now and also which, um, you know, which uh, anti-air missiles uh, uh, systems should be used. Um, and so all of that has to be decided. And part of this is about figuring out what Ukraine's long-term defensive and, you know, counter-attack capabilities should be. So there is an immediate uh, issue of helping them around the Donbass and, you know, then what do you do longer term uh, into the summer, but even beyond that? Well, assuming, Therese, uh, Ukraine is able to get at least some of these weapons that you're describing, how does Russia react to it and change their tactics to cope with uh, a newly armed and differently armed Ukrainian force? Well, I think the Russians will be expecting now a lot of these weapons to be coming into Ukraine. There will be attempts to attack supply lines. We may expect some changes in uh, Russia's tactics. I think mainly what Russia is hoping to do is to try to surround and seal off um, the Ukrainian Joint Operations Forces, which are the most uh, uh, equipped and well-trained uh, areas of Ukrainian uh, forces in the east. Uh, so far, we haven't seen Russia able to uh, adapt quickly to the changing situation on the ground or Ukrainian counterattacks or even um, the defense that Ukraine has, has thrown up. Uh, we're now seeing Russian forces or the reports of Russian forces being resupplied in Belarus. So I think you know, this is going to be a real test. Uh, but, you know, th they have quantity on their side, if not quality. All right, Therese, thank you very much. And, of course, you can read her opinion piece, O-P-I-N, -I -O goes where you want to head on your terminal, Therese Raphael. And we're also getting some lines crossing in response to the train station attack that Ukraine says uh, Russia waged on them, killing some civilians there. EU's Michel demanding more sanctions. Of course, in terms of sanctions, EU already looking at coal sanctions. So the question is, how much further can they go? So, again, this is Charles Michel, uh, the European Council president. Well, coming up later today, we we will continue this conversation. We're going to hear from the top-ranking U.S. diplomat in Ukraine, 8 a.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, also joining us now. He's been back from his vacation in Paris for a few weeks now. But Tom, your thoughts are still in France with your single best chart today. Always in France. Can't wait to get back. It's just a wonderful time. Uh, good morning to Hotel Dabrisson as they get ready for the election. You nailed it, Kaylee, and that that's what we do. We are American tourists. We go and we're within three of their acclaimed R&D small. The view is outside the fourth R&D small. That is, you know, Notre Dame and, and the rest of it. And if you get outside that, it is a decidedly different story. Of course, Francine Lacroix hearing about that in Paris this morning. The chart is simple. The ascent of de Gaulle in the early years and then on to the end of the Mitterrand term and really the malaise in France after Francois Mitterrand and then a boom, and then the boom hasn't happened, not just Macron's fault, but for all sorts of reasons, France, outside of the tourist boom of Paris, has really struggled. Paris makes up now 31% of French GDP. Of course, France and Europe are more likely to see a recession next year than the U.S., and most economists' um, uh, 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 assumptions, because of their... Um, because of their proximity to Ukraine, but that could spread. And you've got Jan Hatzius on, Goldman Sachs, chief economist. He most recently said the U.S. has a 35% chance of recession next year. I wonder if you think that estimation has gone up. I, I, I'm not going to do the modeling of recessions or the trends, Matt. I think it's a raging debate. We heard a lot of optimism yesterday, frankly, on Bloomberg surveillance. And, and when everything is said and done, it's just not the gaming Lisa. of slowdown. Uh, Jan Hatzius, I think, uh, we'll get a, an important end of Friday update on the American economy. All right, really looking forward to that conversation. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. Now, other than that interview with Jan Hatzius, let's take a look at what else we are watching today. I will be watching SpaceX, a rocket launch coming at 11.17 a.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. SpaceX will be carrying its first all-human spaceflight mission to the International Space Station. This is really, really cool. The Washington Post actually has reported, Matt, that three of the crew on this mission paid $55 million per ticket to go to the International Space Station. Well, uh, they will be there for about 10 days. They'll be conducting research experiments uh, on the orbiting laboratory. Super cool. Of course, Ed Ludlow is on the ground there in Florida, and we will be uh, taking everyone through that launch in just about, let me do some math, five hours' time? Yeah, a I'm pretty pumped. I mean, I can't imagine private citizens have, yeah. are going to be able to pay to go up and actually hang mm. out in the ISS. Um, and cool. maybe they'll even meet some Russian cosmonauts. Real. Like, I don't know if you saw Armageddon time. when Carl Hungus was up there. <laughs> um, that was pretty cool. I'm going to be watching the Masters, though, uh, over the weekend. Tiger was uh, finished the day at one under yesterday, which is incredibly impressive after the amazing accident that he survived. And, you know, the fact that he kept his legs is one thing, but the fact that he's able to walk that course, yeah, I've walked... Augusta before had the privilege and uh, it takes a lot out of you even mm -hmm. if you're a healthy person so um, it's going to be amazing uh, and it'll be interesting I think everyone will be rooting for him Danny um, I, will you be able to watch the Masters there do you get coverage <laughs> yeah but I know nothing about golf although I do know there's someone with basically my name Daniel Burger, so I feel like I have to root for him. I don't even know if he's good. Or maybe I am him and he is me. Anyway, I won't really be watching that. I'll be watching the French election. We'll also have coverage for it, special coverage on Sunday. Francine Lacroix and I will also be there walking you through it. More surveillance ahead. This is Bloomberg.